I am into cinema. In fact, I spent many years ago, when I was a lot younger, in 1979, 80, spent um, a year in the 70s uh, bumming around and writing film scripts mm -hmm. with the Silveroid Trap. So Silveroid Trap, but so what, what kind of approach do you have for, for cinema, for movies? How do you go about it? That you, you said you, you were saying that you might have a different approach than, than others. Cinema also tells stories. First of all, a narrative, which, generally speaking, speaks to us through images, you know, cinematic images, metaphors, like motifs and various other things. And so you, you follow it more or less in the same way as you would follow a text, written text. Uh, the major difference between a novel and a movie is that in a movie you uh, some 30, 40 people are involved. In a novel, it's a, you know, it's a one person's effort, uh, plus sometimes the editor or a copy editor. And apart from that, there's nothing else. So the contributions from all the other parties involved, you know, camera work, uh, scenery, uh, social justice, a woman being beaten up, then you know, trampled all over, and then the man walks away. You have to ask yourself more questions about that kind of thing than you would, you know, uh, some other thing. So social justice, many different things work for me, and I would insist that uh, that the director's work is you know, the, the movie director's work, uh, is dependent on the collaboration of so many other people. And as a watcher of movies, I also look at all the other aspects of the film, including... Mm -hmm. You were just mentioning social aspects that, from what I know, are also very important to your work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and, and you remember during the press conference of the jury, I, I mentioned uh, this film Desert Flower about the FGM issue, and then you said that many years ago you had written already about uh, the issue, about the female circumcision. I, yes, I had, I did write, how long ago is 1968? My novel I wrote in 1968. It's 41 years old. There you go. My first novel was about uh, female circumcision, we called it, or female infibulation. Uh, and I've written about it continuously in almost every work, major or non-major. I have written about that. And it's not a subject with which I am unfamiliar. It's a subject about which I have, uh, you know, written a lot about it. But I would simply add what I said in the, at the press conference, that 50% of the job has to be done, first of all, by people, locally based Somalis, people, mainly Somalis, Ethiopians, and Eritreans, wherever, wherever female infibulation takes place. The rest of the world could give the back up and support. And then the legal impediments, the legal, what you call it, not impediments, legal framework, which would make it impossible for women living in the West, in North America, in Europe, to continue performing female infibulation in young women. In other words, if somebody says, you do not do it, and if you do it, we would put you in prison, that would send signals to, 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 to people. And then if you put one or two of them in prison, one or two of them, you don't have to put them, you know, 10,000 of them in prison, one or two of them would suffice. Work is being done locally, but there is, you know, resistance. And the reason why there is resistance in Somalia or in many of those other places, is because people think this is uh, our tradition. 
And even a man like me, I'm attacked quite often. I'm attacked quite often about, you know, writing about women or writing about uh, female infibulation. And so I'm very happy to, 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 uh, to know that some of the women are doing it. And some of the women locally based would be far better positioned than, and I'm not belittling the effort being put in by uh, Waze Deary and some of the others. Uh, Do you know her personally? Do you know her books? I don't. I I read. I I took a look at a copy of the first one. Yeah, the first one. It's an autobiographical mm -hmm. book. But in Somalia, they do have a law against FGM, as far as I know. Well, it's discouraged, let's say. There is no uh, dictum that says you cannot do it if you did it. And then in Somalia, there's no law anyway, so that's the point to concentrate <laughs> only on that aspect of things. You know, there, there's, no, there's been a civil war for the past for no so many years now. Mm -hmm. uh, but women are aware of it, and you know how, how I know, because, you know, I have, I have five sisters, and they have daughters, and I have friends, and you know, so on and so forth. And what are some of the things that happen continuously once women, some other women have arrived, not only some other women in Ethiopia, some other have arrived in the West, especially through delivery and other you know, patrician difficulties, you know, delivery and seeing a gynecologist and all this. Women have become aware of it. And therefore many women voluntarily, without being told by anyone, do not do it. And my sister is going to do it, for example. They've come out. They've, they've, it's been done to them, but they do not. Do it to their daughters. They do not do it to their daughters, and the reason is because they know, they know the you know uh, the complication, the health complication. What role do the men play in African society? The difficulty I find that it's always said it's a taboo for men, it's a woman's affair, and they have to take care of it. But then I cannot imagine that it can really change uh, when the men keep it to be a taboo. Publicly, they stay away from it, many of them. Mm -hmm. um, but publicly, I don't stay away from it. And I know some other men who do not stay away from it. One other way of coming through is to deprive uh, female infibulation the Quranic sanction, you know, the Islamic sanction. If you tell them this is not done in Saudi Arabia, it's not done in Syria, it's not done in many Arab countries, it's not. Islamic, in other words, because the, the, through tradition, people have been misinformed that it is part of the Islamic faith. And people who are ill-read, ill-educated, uninformed, ill-informed, Ill, Ill, whatever, do not know the complications of how they have been misled to believe. And even in Somalia, we call it the Pharaonic right, because it came to us from Egypt from the pharaohs, you know, through, through many centuries. What is your position about the stability and the search of democracy and stability and peace in, in Africa? How, what is your feeling? Yeah. How is, how well, it, it has, there are two ways of answering that question. One is a very long, long way. And I'll take a middle way. I'll say to you that in Europe, you people have had your 30-year wars. You had it many years ago, in the 16th, 17th centuries. You had your civil wars. In America, they've done the same. In England, they've done the same. In France, they've done the same. We didn't have our civil wars, you know, four, three, four hundred years ago, because of the arrival and imposition of decrees that were alien to the African, and therefore. When the Europeans came, we started fighting against the Europeans, continued fighting against the Europeans, who became independent in 1960. We haven't had a moment in which we could look at each other face to face and fight for democracy, for social justice. 
We have in that now. It's taken 20, 30 years. I think that it is something that has been the retardation took place when the Portuguese arrived 1610, you know. The Italians arrived 18 something. The French arrived, you know, so long ago. So instead of fighting amongst ourselves, we said let's fight with the foreigner, against the foreigner. We've been fighting against the foreigner, the foreigner left. Now we have to sort out. This is an internal problem. This will sort itself out. Mm -hmm. So I'm not worried very much, except what worries me is this continuous interference from outside the continent that obviously protracts, prolongs the war and that is disturbing.